Okay, this is the second hour of Physics 1B for section 1377 for September 22nd. All right, let's pick up this discussion where we left off. We were talking about absolute zero, and there was a question in the chat. Um, Jacob said, so it's impossible to reach zero Pascals as well. Yeah, so let's, let's mention something more about Kelvin. So in the laboratory, so understand that this plot right here, all the data points are up here in regions where the pressure is above zero and where the temperature is also above zero, right? We just extrapolate back, right? That that we assume that that pattern is going to continue all the way back to here. Does it continue all the way back to here? I don't know, but um, you know, we just making that assumption. And you know, when, when you start to see patterns like this, everything kind of meeting up in the same location, it tends to be a hint that something's going on, right? And so in modern times, we've tried really hard to actually reach absolute zero in the laboratory. But the lowest temperatures that we've been able to, to reach, maybe someone, could you look up the lowest temperature ever achieved in the laboratory? Can someone look that up real quick on the internet? Um, I'd be interested to know what it says. I remember when I first started teaching, we used to say nano Kelvins. I think since then, um, they've they've managed to get to temperatures that are on the order of like pico kelvins. Um, can someone look that up for me? How much? What's the lowest a temperature that's ever been achieved in a laboratory? Let's see if someone can figure that out. So something like the lowest temperatures are going to be something on the order of maybe pico kelvins, and you all probably know what nano is. You might not remember what pico is. Pico is ten to the negative twelve kelvins. So something in this region between ten to the negative nine kelvins and you might think, oh, 280 picokelvins. Okay. 280. So that's actually 0.28 nanokelvins. So yeah, it is in the picokelvin range. Now you might think, oh, okay, 280 picokelvins. What is that? I mean, that's, that's nothing, right? If I told you that the smallest distance we'd ever measured was one picometer, you'd be like, well, that's pretty much zero. It's a super tiny distance, right? But, uh... It just seems like it gets harder and harder and harder to get down to a lower temperature. Thank you all for all those answers. I appreciate that. It gets harder and harder and harder to get down to that lower temperature. It takes more and more energy. Interesting things happen around these temperatures too. Here we go. 100 pico kelvin. There we go. 100 pico kelvin above absolute zero. That's 0 0.000000001. Yeah, I mean, it is such a tiny number, right? Um, so we, we do believe this absolute zero is a real thing though, because when you start to reach a wall where like you're trying to get to colder and cooler temperatures and you just can't get there, it starts to seem reasonable that there is something called absolute zero. Now, um, why is it hard? Why is it difficult to, to get down to this, to this, uh, this temperature? So we got to think about how we cool things off, right? If I have a can of soda and it's warm and I want to cool it off, what kind of things can I do? If you have a can of soda and you want to cool it off, what can you do? Assuming you have access to all of our modern technology. You can put it in a cooler with ice. You can put it in the fridge. If you want to get it colder, after it's been in the fridge for a few hours, you know it's going to be pretty cool. If you wanted to get it even colder, you'd have to put it into the freezer or something like that, right? What if you wanted to get your can and make it even colder than it would be if you put it into a standard freezer? How would you how would you make it even colder than if, than being in a freezer? What could you do? Put <laughs> freezer in a freezer. That's fun. Put the fridge in the Antarctic winter. Okay. I bet the Antarctic is probably even colder than your freezer is, so that would be a good... Yeah, you could take it down to the Antarctic and throw it in the... Throw it in the ocean. Throw it, throw it in the snow. Um, what about... What about... Are there any other substances that are colder than your freezer? That, that you know about? Maybe something you might be able to buy at the grocery store? Dry ice! Yeah, sure, dry ice is really cold, right? So you could get a Styrofoam cooler and you could fill it with dry ice, put your, put your can in there and it would get even colder, right? Um, and of course, in general, you know, we've come across the, the problem, right? Which is that in order, liquid nitrogen, you want to get it even colder, use liquid nitrogen, right? Exactly. 
So we kind of hit upon the main problem here, which is that in order to cool off your soda can, you're going to need something colder than it, right? And you're going to reach a limitation where you can no longer go to the store and purchase something that is colder than it. In fact, I don't think you can go buy liquid nitrogen. you got to go to a specialty place. And then you, you have to have uh, some device that will keep it from evaporating too much, like a doer. Um, the point is that the only the simplest way to make things colder is just to find something that's colder than. So what do they do? Because obviously, once you get down to these super low temperatures, there's nothing out there that's colder, right? Well, some things they can do is they can actually use laser cooling. There's a way to, to use lasers to cool things down. Something interesting happens. A laser is light, basically, and light is a wave. So if you can, if you can get two waves of light coming in, um, there's this way in which you can kind of reduce the temperature of particles by doing that. Lasers can really be used for anything. Sure, they, they have a lot, of, uh, a lot of applications. And at these really low temperatures, there's interesting physics that occur. So you all know about uh, the different types of, um, uh, you know, states of matter, right? Which are going from uh, hottest to coldest. You've got, here, let's go the other way. We'll go from coldest to hottest. So you've got solid, right? you got liquid. And you got gas, right? And temperature increases in this direction. What, do you, what happens if you take a gas and you heat it heated enough? What's the next state of matter that occurs? Usually people know what this one is. What's the next state of matter? Plasma, yeah. What is plasma? Anyone know what plasma is? Not the plasma in your, your blood has plasma in it too, which you can donate, right? What is plasma? It's a super gas, sure. It's super gas. So a plasma is a gas that's been heated up so much that the electrons get removed from the atoms. Uh, the sun is in a state of plasma, and the plasma is basically an ionized gas. That's all it is. It's a gas of ions. Ions are charged particles, right? So um, a plasma is a gas of charged particles, and electrically charged particles have certain you know, they exhibit certain properties. And as a result, um, you get interesting electrical properties for plasmas. And they can do things like solar flares are, are produced um, when magnetic fields become really large and moving charged particles can produce big magnetic fields, all kinds of stuff, interesting stuff. There's a whole field of physics called plasma physics. All right, what about colder than a solid? Does anyone know a state of gas that's lower on the temperature scale? In fact, actually very close to absolute zero is when this state occurs. Anyone ever heard of that one? There's there's more than just the ones I'm mentioning. There's other types of states of matter. Okay, so as you go lower temperature, does anyone know what it is? It was first discovered in the United States in 1995 by a group of scientists in Boulder, Colorado. It was predicted to exist by uh, a couple of scientists, one was named Bose, the other one's named Einstein, and you guys all know Einstein. The name of it is a B-E-C for short, and it stands for a Bose-Einstein. This one has the best name, by far. It sounds the most official. A Bose-Einstein condensate. It's a special state of matter <laughs> Einstein predicted a lot of stuff. Yeah. So it's a special state of matter that exists very close to absolute zero, very low temperatures. I think it's like four or five Kelvin range. And in this state, you have all new properties that are, that are interesting and, and can be studied. Um, and, uh, you know, I encourage you to, if you want to, you can go read about it. But I think, I believe one of the things that happens in this state is that the, the particles all behave like bosons, which means they can all be piled into the same state I don't want to go into a lot of details about that. Anyway, so people that like to study low temperature physics often are, 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 are focused on studying this type of material, which is called a BEC or Bose Einstein condensate. All right, so predicted to exist by Einstein and Bose in the 1920s, discovered in America in 1995, which is pretty neat. And the physicists that discovered this won the Nobel Prize a few years later for the discovery because it was a huge, huge deal. Um, actually, 
creating these things in a lab. And then when I was in grad school in the 2000s, uh, there was a group at my, there was a low temperature physics group at my um, school. I think they called themselves condensed matter physicists. But um, yeah, they actually were producing these things in a lab. And when I would go down into their labs, it was so neat. Their lab was just nothing but lasers and mirrors. Uh, it was just all these lasers set up to like bounce off of mirrors so that they could get the right frequency and the right phase difference so that they can bombard their substances uh, with lasers. And then they, they let me look at this stuff too, which is really cool. Um, really neat. Anyway, so let's go back to, I don't think I actually answered your question about pressure. What was your original question? So it's impossible to reach zero pressure as well. Yes, I can just answer that now. Because we can't actually reach this temperature, we can't actually reach zero pressure. And what would zero pressure even mean? That would mean that the uh, the substance we were studying exerted no pressure on its environment. That's pretty hard to believe. And we believe now, thanks to our understanding of quantum physics, which describes the way that small particles act, that it's absolutely impossible to reach a zero pressure condition. And it's probably also possible impossible to reach absolute zero because there is no way you can stop a particle from vibrating. That's basically what we've discovered. All particles vibrate. They move, they jiggle. They don't like to stay still. And the smaller something is, the more it likes to jiggle. And um, one thing that quantum mechanics tells us is there is no such thing as a particle with zero energy. And absolute zero would be a state of zero energy as well. Zero pressure, zero temperature, zero energy. And we found that there's actually what's called a ground state. It's sometimes referred to as zero point energy. And sometimes science fiction movies, they love to they love to turn that into something it isn't. But zero point energy is the lowest possible energy state for a particle. And if you take physics 1B, you'll learn exactly what that is. what that is. Um, yeah. What is a fermionic condensate? I do not know. But is it related to the Bose-Einstein condensate? Possibly. Is that, where you, is that why you're asking about that, David? We can talk about more about that after class. Yeah, let's talk, let's, let's, let's talk, let's go into details about that after class. Is there negative pressure though? I've heard of it before. Where did you hear about negative pressure? Difference, of, yeah, a difference of pressure could be negative, sure. You could have negative gauge pressure, possibly. David, you're saying you heard about negative pressure when you Google Bose Einstein condensate, or you heard about fermionic condensate when you Googled it? Oh, do they have negative pressure? The BECs have negative pressure? I don't know much about this stuff. Or, I mean, oh, fermionic, okay. Uh, you're getting into, uh, yeah. So, I don't think negative pressure is real, but I will say that uh, when you read about astronomy, when you read about cosmology, sometimes they talk about this negative pressure that's pushing on the universe. Have you heard of that? Is that what you were thinking of, Jacob? That there's a negative pressure that pushes galaxies apart from each other? Is that what you're thinking of? That's that's where I've heard of that. You haven't heard of that? Have you heard of dark energy? Dark energy is this this thing we believe exists that uh, kind of fills all of space and causes the causes galaxies to constantly be pushing apart from each other. You know, we believe you've probably heard this before. You've you've heard the expression the universe is expanding. Have you all heard that? The universe is expanding. Do you believe that? Do you believe that's true? What does that even mean? Um, it means that the distance between galaxies is not fixed, and that um, you know galaxies are moving. You know, but you can think of these galaxies as just particles. And um, what we find is that when we look around, when we look, it does. Kate, you're exactly right. You're very smart. You're very, you know a lot. So um, when we look at all of the galaxies near us, 
they all seem to be moving away from us, except for the ones that are really close. Some of the some of the really close ones are actually coming towards us, but as we look at distant galaxies, we find that they're all moving away from us. And the way that we know this is because we can look at those galaxies and we can look at the light coming from the galaxies and we know what that light should look like when we pass it through a spectrum. And when we look at that spectrum, the spectrum is shifted to the red. They call that red shift. And the farther away a galaxy is, the bigger this quantity is. And what that tells us is that it appears to us from our perspective in the universe as we look around that everything is moving away from us. Now, one possible explanation of that would be, oh, we're in the center of the universe and everything's just expanding away from us. But that's a very selfish way of thinking about it. We believe that any other observer in the universe would see exactly the same thing. And the only way that could be true is if space itself is expanding, if the distance between galaxies is just growing larger and larger and larger because space itself is pushing on it. And the, the thing that we use to describe how that happens is dark energy. And it's sometimes described as a negative pressure. A negative pressure that instead of pushing in on things is pushing out on things. You can think of it as opposite of gravity. Gravity has this effect that it pulls things together, right? Dark energy does the exact opposite. It pushes things apart. Some people even believe it's just like negative gravity or something like that. You know, that it's that it's just the way that gravity works. That on, on large scales, maybe gravity starts to become repulsive and on close scales, it becomes attractive. We don't know. It is one of the major unsolved mysteries in physics is what is dark energy. There have been some very recent discoveries, actually, that are pointing towards an answer, but um, yeah, maybe negative mass? I don't know. We don't think mass can be negative, but, you know, we uh, we didn't believe there was uh, negative energy states for matter, and then we, when we assumed that there were, all of a sudden it produced this thing called the antimatter, and now, yeah. So maybe you can have negative negative mass. Maybe you can have like imaginary mass or something. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't know. It's always important to understand that whatever I know about physics is going to be all wrong about a hundred years from now. You know what I mean? Whatever I'm teaching you right now, some of it is probably right. Some of it's probably wrong. And a hundred years from now, everything. So so while we haven't observed negative mass, it doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, it's possible. I don't know. I don't think it's likely. That doesn't mean it's not possible, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100 years ago, let's say 120, because things really started to change in 1905. Einstein wrote a bunch of papers in 1905 that really upended physics, but um, if you go back to, like, 1900, the community of physics really thought they had it all figured out. They really did. Um, they thought that there were no new things to solve and that they just, they had it all figured out. Um, but then a series of experiments came along. And you have to understand the reason why they thought this was because pretty much all of their theories matched up with reality, right? Um, the theories of the time, there were two of them pretty much. Yeah, three maybe. It was basically electricity and magnetism and gravity or mechanics basically physics 1a and physics 1c and of course we also understood thermodynamics if you want to call that a separate idea but um but what happened at the beginning of the century was that um a bunch of different experiments started to prop up and classical physics could not explain them classical physics could not explain them amongst them were things called black body radiation the photoelectric effect the Compton effect all kinds of different things but the point is that the rules of classical physics were completely wrong in describing these systems, and a group of scientists, a large group of scientists, started to slowly write down the new rules of physics that would describe what was happening in these systems. All these systems have one thing in common. They all involved tiny little particles, things like electrons and protons, which also, unsurprisingly, were starting to be discovered right around that time. I believe the electron was discovered in 1899, and then the neutron was discovered shortly thereafter, and then after that they discovered the proton, um, or some order like that. Yeah, so, um, anyway, all these little tiny things, they had to write down new ideas, and a lot of them kind of got kick-started with Einstein. Einstein wrote a bunch of papers in 1905 to explain all these different ideas, like how does the photoelectric effect work, how does something called Brownian motion work, 
um, something called special relativity, which showed us that uh, measurements of space and time depend on how fast you're moving. All kinds of different things that just turned everything on its head. And then about 10 years later, he proved that Newton was wrong. He proved that Newton's theory was only a low energy theory and that uh, it's possible to write down a new theory of gravity. So, so in the course of about 20 years, where they thought that they had everything figured out, um, you know, just everything changed. And now <laughs> we're finding new problems every day that need to be solved. All right. Do you learn all about Einstein in 1D? You know, that's a good question because here we are, you're, you're in 1C now. No, this is 1B, right? If you take 1A, 1B, and 1C, I don't think Einstein's name is ever gonna come up, unless I'm just talking about Einstein, right? Einstein shows up, yeah, primarily in 1D because 1D is about modern physics and optics. So yeah, you learn about all about Einstein in physics 1D. You learn about special relativity. You learn a little bit about general relativity, which is gravity. Um, you'll learn a little bit about uh, the photoelectric effect and his explanation of it. What else are you gonna do? You'll also learn about a guy named Max Planck or Max Planck, who's a huge, huge uh, factor in this whole development as well. All right, so absolute zero, really interesting concept. Um, it allows us to have an absolute scale of temperature. And just to remind you, as you do problems in this class, when you do mathematical calculations, you're always going to want to use Kelvin, except for certain um, certain uh, special situations, one of which we will see right now. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about is thermal expansion. That'll be the last topic for tonight. One thing that's very interesting, by the way, is um, amongst the laws that uh, Einstein and others started to overturn at the beginning of the century, thermodynamics is not one of them. The fundamental ideas of thermodynamics didn't change when going from classical to modern physics. New ideas had to come about, but... Uh, I don't even know if I get that, but it is kind of funny. It's a funny picture. All right. What is it saying? That 90 degrees times 4 is equal to 360, which equals 360 degrees. So a square is a circle. Okay. All right. Um, so thermal expansion. So this is the idea that when you add temperature to an object, that it tends to increase. Okay. I don't have a derivation for you or anything like that, so I'm just gonna give you a picture of this equation and show you how we use it. So suppose that I take an object like a piece of metal, all right, and I tell you that this object initially has a length that we're gonna call L sub zero. We'll call that the initial length, okay? And now I tell you that I add some heat to this, right? So I heat it up. The temperature is gonna change, and when the temperature changes, the object expands and it expands by some amount. Not only will it expand in terms of its length, but it'll also expand in terms of its width as well. But we're just now, for now, we're just gonna talk about the, uh, the length. So let's say that it expands by an amount that we call delta L or the change in length, okay? There is a relationship for this where if I say that the initial temperature of this is T0, I say the temperature of this is Tf, so maybe it goes from like 30 degrees Celsius up to 70 degrees Celsius then we know that the change in length delta L is proportional to the original length. So the longer it was originally, the bigger the change is gonna be. And it's also proportional to the change in temperature. So the, the size of the change in temperature is obviously going to affect how much it grows. If you heat it up by twice as much, it grows by twice as much. Pretty simple. How much does it actually grow? Well, there's a coefficient that we call alpha which is referred to as the coefficient of linear expansion. And to find out what alpha is, you look it up in a table, which um, I think I have over here somewhere. Here we go. So we look at this table right here, it shows us what alpha is. Alpha is a very small number. 
because things do not expand by a lot. Let's push this over so we can just focus on what we care about. Here's a table of coefficients of linear expansion. Aluminum, brass, copper, these are all metals. They have coefficients of 2.4 times 10 to the negative five. The unit is degree Celsius inverse or Kelvin inverse, just in order to make the units work out. Notice that something like aluminum and something like steel, right? What do you notice about them? Steel has a coefficient of 1.2 times 10 to the negative five. Aluminum has a coefficient of 2.4 times 10 to the negative five. What this means is that for every degree Celsius that you increase aluminum, you're going to get an increase in length that's proportional to this number. When you compare steel and aluminum, steel has twice as large of a coefficient of linear expansion. What does that mean? If I take a piece of steel, that's say 10 meters, and I take a piece of aluminum that's also 10 meters, right? And I increase the temperature of each of them by 10 degrees Celsius, let's say, which one of them will be longer? Will it be the steel or will it be the aluminum? Which one will have a larger, yeah, exactly, Ariana, exactly. The aluminum is going to expand more, that's exactly right. Now, when we compare this to something like glass, notice that glass has a coefficient of linear expansion that's about one sixth as big as aluminum. That tells us that glass does not expand nearly as, uh, nearly as much. And when you come down to something like quartz, which has a strong crystalline structure, uh, it expands even less factor of 10 less than glass does, right? Okay. So things like metals tend to expand very easily. That probably shouldn't be too surprising because after all, it's very easy to bend metals, right? They're very malleable. You can take a piece of metal and you can hammer it out into a sheet, right? Now, why does this happen? I don't know if this is, are these standards? Let's see, I don't know, I don't know, David. Uh, what do you mean by that for general metals? Um, well, this is just a table from your book that was published who knows how long ago. Um, I suspect that uh, any any given material may be slightly different from these, if that's that's what you're asking. But, uh, you know, when we're doing homework problems and stuff, we're going to use these numbers. Yeah, I mean, notice that with glass, they're saying, oh, there's a range for glass because there's all kinds of different types of glass, but for aluminum, they're not saying anything. Um, anyway, okay, so why does this happen? Why do things actually expand when you heat them up? So this is a picture of, um, it says a model of the forces between neighboring atoms in the solid. So this is supposed to be a model of a solid where each of these orange balls right here represents a, um, an atom. So let's say each one of these is like, for example, an aluminum atom. So that's an aluminum atom, that's an aluminum atom, and so on and so forth. It turns out that if you actually take a piece of metal and you you look at it in a, in a scanning electron microscope, one of, the, one of the highest resolution microscopes we have, they really do form these patterns. They form these like crystalline, like lattice type of patterns. It's really quite beautiful. Maybe I can find a picture of it after this. Anyway, every one of those is an aluminum atom, right? Now, what I told you earlier is that atoms, things that are small, they don't like to sit still. They really hate it. Everything that's small likes to move fast. Um, it's just like animals, you know? Really small animals like rabbits and squirrels, they're really quick, which allows them to evade predators. Really large animals like, um, I don't know, bears are relatively slow. All the bears can run really fast. Anyway, point is, tiny things like to move fast and they like to jiggle a lot. They like to vibrate around, right? When you add temperature, when you increase the temperature of the metal, they vibrate with even bigger amplitudes, okay? The effect of that is to expand out the average separation of the molecules. So as they try to vibrate in larger and larger amplitudes, the molecules themselves are gonna have to spread out from each other to make room for them to do that. And it basically kind of stretches out the spring, the bond between them as well. And that's effectively why it is that when you heat something up that they expand, when you cool something down, it can contract. There are practical applications of this that you have to consider when you're building things like bridges and railroads and sidewalks and things like this. All materials will expand with heat. So if you live in a region where the temperature changes 
violently, like where I'm from, Oklahoma, where the temperature can go from, you know, 32 degrees freezing one day to the next day it might be 70 degrees outside. Um, this can cause things like cracks in sidewalks when, when the temperature change is really rapid, okay? So one of the ways that you can combat this problem is, and this is an example of it right here, this is a picture of train tracks. So this is one rail of train tracks right here. And if you look closely right here, you'll notice, as indicated by this arrow, that there's a small gap in between the tracks right here. That small gap is designed so that it will still allow the train to roll over it without causing any damage to the track, to the, the wheels or anything like that. But when it gets hot outside and this piece of metal here expands, and of course the other piece of metal here expands as well, the two objects will get closer to each other, but they won't touch each other. Because if they did, then the track itself would have to start to bend. Like if they start to touch each other and the thing still wants to expand, the only way it's going to expand is to bend the track and cause it to buckle. So you leave a gap that's big enough so that uh, that won't ever be a problem, right? Have you ever seen anything like this on bridges or anything like that around Los Angeles? You see them a lot on freeways. On freeways, yeah. There's like gaps in the road, right? Exactly. Um, you all were mentioning that it was very hot today. So on a day like today, the you know the bridges and things like that are going to expand a lot. I, I I live in San Pedro, and from time to time drive over to Long Beach and other areas to the east of me. Um, there's a bridge that connects San Pedro to Long Beach called the Vincent Thomas Bridge. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that before, right? The suspension bridge, the really big one. The green one or the brand new the, white one? The green one, yeah. And there's also the brand new white one too, right? That, that, that directly, there's two different bridges. Um, but uh, specifically the green one, the Vincent Thomas Bridge, Thomas Bridge, it has, if you, if, you, if you drive over it, if you look down, you'll notice that there's basically just different segments of the road. Um, and these segments are separated by these gaps so that if it does expand, it won't cause the bridge to collapse or something like that, right? So, uh, anyway, that's thermal expansion. We've got about enough time to solve one problem, so we're going to try to do that problem. If we have a little bit more time, we might solve another one. All right. Expansion of railroad track. It's a very straightforward problem, but I think it's a it's a good idea. Let me grab this too, because we'll need this. Copy, paste. This problem involves a steel railroad track, so we're also going to need a piece of information about steel. So we'll just go to like right here. All right. So it says a segment of steel railroad track has a length of 30 meters, 30.000 meters, when the temperature is 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius. What is its length when the temperature is 40 degrees Celsius? All right, so we have a piece of steel, blue steel, that has a length of L naught that we're gonna call, or that's 30 meters, and it has an initial temperature, T naught, that's equal to zero degrees Celsius. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna heat it up. It's gonna expand. And we wanna calculate what its final length is gonna be. Where we know that the amount by which it expands, we call delta L, and we can calculate that from that equation. So our goal is to figure out its final length when the temperature, T final, is equal to 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, very simple, plug and chug kind of thing, as you will find is a lot of what we do in Physics 1B, although we can make things trickier too. So it says delta L is equal to alpha L naught delta T. So we can say delta L is equal to, and then we can start plugging in the quantities. So alpha is steel. 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. If I scroll back up a little, you'll see that the units for this are degree Celsius to the negative 1. That's a 1, negative 1. We multiply that times our initial length, which was 30 meters. And we multiply that times the change in temperature, which is going to be final temperature, 40 degrees Celsius, minus 0 degrees Celsius. Do I need to convert these to Kelvin? No, because I would just add 273 to the first one, I would add 273 to the second one, and the difference would still be 40. 
because after all, the change in temperature is the same whether you're talking about Celsius or Kelvin. So anytime you see delta T, you can use Celsius. But that's it, that's the only time. When you see a T in an equation, like, I don't know, some of you have probably taken, uh, some of you have probably taken chemistry, right? When you use the ideal gas law, how do you have to, what do you have to put in for temperature? You have to put in Kelvin, right? All right, so this problem, it's okay though, because it's delta T, not just T, all right? So what would delta L be then? We can probably do this calculation in our heads, right? Because it's like 40 times 30, which is 1200, and we multiply by 1.2, which is 12 times 1.2 is gonna be like 1.44. And then I think it's gonna be 0. 0.144 maybe? Is that right? Calculate that. So to get the final length then, we just take delta L plus L naught. And that will be 30 point one four four meters. Not much of a change. I mean, it's 14 centimeters, though. That's pretty significant. Although to go from zero degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius is a massive change. That's like going from freezing to boiling almost. Not boiling, but freezing to one of the hottest temperatures that is experienced on the Earth. I think the record for the hottest temperature on Earth may be like 45 degrees Celsius. Maybe it's 42 degrees Celsius. I don't know, but it's in the 40s. It's in the 40s. It was probably right around here. It's 0. 0.0144. That seems more realistic, yeah. That seems a lot more realistic. Okay, so let's fix this. So this is gonna be, I was gonna say, things don't expand by that much. 0.0144, okay, we fixed it there. Okay, part B, this is where we need this equation. Suppose the ends of the rail are tightly clamped at zero degrees Celsius so that the expansion is pre prevented. What is the thermal stress set up in the rail if its temperature is raised to 40 degrees Celsius? Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we're gonna clamp our object. We're gonna clamp this piece of steel in between two points so it cannot expand. And we're going to figure out the stress that's placed in the rod. Okay, so this is still 30 meters here. And to figure out the stress, tensile stress, is given by Young's modulus times delta L over L initial, okay? So to find the stress, you have to find something called Young's modulus for steel. We'll go look that up in the textbook. You multiply that by delta L over Li. Now we actually have already calculated these things, so we're gonna be multiplying this times 0.0144 divided by its initial length, which was 30. To find Young's modulus, okay, we're gonna go to your textbook. We're gonna go back to chapter 11. Someone looks it up for me, thank you, Louis. So I just wanna show you where it is in your text. So if you go to mechanics, chapter 11, stress strain and elastic moduli, you will find a table that looks like this. These are called Young's moduli. And if we come down here to steel, you get 20 times 10 to the 10. Pretty close to the number you put in there, right? We're gonna use 20 times 10 to the 10. This is the units of Pascals. <laughs> no, I lost my pen right at the end of class. Oh, it's right there. All right, so we plug in right here for the Young's modulus of steel. We're gonna put 20 times 10 to the 10 Pascals. That'll give us our stress, which is gonna be 0.0. I got 96 million, or 9.6 times 10 to the seven. <laughs> It's a lot. 
and I'll just write it as newtons per meter squared. It's in units of pascals. So this would be the kind of pressure that the uh, object is under. That's really big, right? Okay. Okay. Finish that problem. Ah, it's 8.30. I want to do one more. But that's as far as we're going to get. The other problem I want to do, we'll do it next time. Oh, it's somewhere over here. Yeah, it's interesting, right? It only expanded by, what is this, about 1.4 centimeters. But if we don't let it expand, it's a crazy amount of uh, pressure that's going to be placed on it, right? Crazy amount of pressure. It better be pretty thick or else it's definitely going to buckle and break or something. Okay, so we're going to stop there. And next class, the same group of people that came last or two weeks ago for lab, we're going to have a lab. Uh, I'm just going to go to Canvas so I can make sure, uh, El Camino, make sure that everybody's on the same page with this. I think it's F5, right? Does that sound right to you all? I just don't remember off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's F5. Yeah. All right, so if I go here, in case you ever need to find this, it's under the syllabus. And on our syllabus, it has the list. I think it's going to be F5 this week. The week after that is going to be an exam. And then the other group's going to go and do F5. So next Monday night, Monday night, right? Uh, we'll call it Group A is going to do F5. Not the people that came this week, but the people that came two weeks ago. Okay. And that is that for tonight. I hope you all have a great weekend. I will stick around and answer questions about homework. So stopping the stream now.